Welcome back to another episode of Character Evolution Cast. It's just me this week while Ryan takes a much deserved break to spend time with his family. Because I don't have my usual partner in crime, I'm going to try and keep this intro short, but I'm not going to make any promises. To start, next month is International Podcast Month, and as we mentioned last week, Ryan will be all up in it. So if you are interested in hearing him be just the nicest boy, be sure to check out the website at internationalpodcastmonth.com and subscribe to the I Am Here, H-E-A-R, podcast feed. With Ryan not here, I'm not going to read a review this week. Instead, I'm going to be slightly sappy and heartfelt for a moment because I can. Rejoining the gaming community has changed my life in absolutely immeasurable ways. It brought me out of my shell, it helped me find new friends, and it taught me that I could be absolutely anything I wanted. Doing this podcast with Ryan has given me something to look forward to and to pour my creative energy into as I navigate an incredibly difficult time in my life. It has helped me rediscover who I am and who I want to be. It is also how I met Jude, who is the person you'll hear in this episode, who I now consider to be one of my best friends. He's going to absolutely hate everything about this, which is honestly part of why I'm saying it. Um, But he has been the person who assured me that I could do things when I was positive I couldn't who listened to all of my absurd ideas for this podcast, including adding character evolution cast episodes, and who let me complain without ever once saying, then why don't you just quit? I firmly believe everyone should have a friend like that in their lives. I am thrilled that he is finally going to put his creative projects out into the world, And I can't think of a better place for that to start than with a podcast about the obscure corners of Tolkien's works. I am not at all being facetious in this episode later on when I say that I can't wait for Athrobeth to release. It's a topic that Jude has a wealth of knowledge about. His co-host Steph is absolutely hilarious and an absolutely delightful person. I am positive this project is going to be fantastic. I will put all of the links in the show notes for their website and Twitter, but you guys, seriously, please keep an eye out for it. Um, It will release on September 5th, and I really encourage you to take a listen. With all of that really terrible, sappy stuff out of the way, here is our episode. Welcome to Character Evolution Cast, a show where we discuss what to do with all those characters we just made. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and today my co-host Ryan is taking some paternity leave because even if the U.S. government doesn't believe in a strong social safety net, I do, and socialism is better. So instead, I am joined by my friend Jude, who is an RPG player, GM, and host of the very soon-to-be-released Athrobeth podcast. Jude, do you want to tell people who you are? Sure. I'm Jude Vase. I am one of the co-hosts of the Atherbeth podcast. My co- other co-host is Steph Midlock. Uh, you can find us on uh, Twitter at Atherbeth underscore cast. Atherbeth is a podcast where we dig into some of the weird and strange and stupid corners of Tolkien's Legendarium. My expertise on the podcast is all of the Tolkien academic nerpery and the weird elf stuff. And Steph is the humor and the fun part. And between the two of us, <laughs> we uh, we have a good time talking about all the interesting and strange parts of the Legendarium that you don't necessarily get just reading the Lord of the Rings or even some of the stuff in the Lord of the Rings that you don't necessarily dig into all the time. Okay, but I went to see the movie earlier this weekend, just the second one, so I feel like I know as much as you do. 
you know, you get a lot of people that think that. And I, I still encourage you to t- give it a listen because I think you might find there's some stuff in there you haven't heard before. So normally we talk to people who are doing specifically RPG related things, but I feel like that's not necessarily what we need to be doing here. So we are still going to try and get to know you. It's just different than other people. Normally I'd ask like RPG design questions and stuff, but that doesn't make any sense. I could ask you, but it wouldn't, you wouldn't have any answers for me. So you are still doing cool things though. So you have to answer questions about yourself because people need to know who you are. I would like you to summarize, as best you can, the plot of the first RPG campaign you played in. Oh, dang. The first one that I can remember... That'll work. I know we had a couple of abortive attempts. We did Trinity, was the very first thing I played, and I don't think we even had a campaign. I think it was like two sessions. I'm going to butcher this. I'm sorry, Ryan. This is going to make you sound bad, but... My friend Ryan ran the most extra vampire campaign of all time. Mm. Uh, wait, when... wait, wait. Is there any non-extra vampire campaign? Oh, man. No, you buckle up. Oh, boy. I'm here for this. This was set in a post-apocalyptic America uh, in a city. I'm blanking on what it was called, but it was built above the ruins of Seattle and Portland, I think it was like a mega metropolis that was built on stilts above those two cities. Okay. We played, there was a Lazambra, a Malkavian, that was me, and a Ventru that did nothing that I recall particularly, except die a lot. <laughs> Poor guy. And then Ryan had his, his name was Raven. So he had this, this character named Raven. That was one of the Ravnos, I think they were called. We were somehow tasked by the prince of the city to do something that involved tussling with first the werewolves on the outskirts of the city. And then there was these little Zemis. I have no idea if that's how you pronounce them. That's how we pronounced it. Cthulhu octopus things that we had to fight. And then there was some... It was... Just completely bonkers. The thing I mostly remember about that campaign was just that I really enjoyed playing a Malkavian, and I really, really took it to the most expected levels of extra. How old were you when this was going on? I, I need was to know like, how okay it was to be extra at this point. Uh, like 17. Okay, that's... Yeah, like 17, 16, 17. Yeah, I mean, I feel like everybody is awful at that point. I don't think I could tell you the plot of like the first game. I'm not sure that it had a plot. Yeah, honestly. I mean, I'm assigning. I know there was a campaign because we played this vampire game for. I mean, it felt like a year, I think, or something like that. But I honestly, I, I only remember snippets like the octopus, fleshcraft things, and the the werewolves and little bits and pieces. Next question for you: Your podcast. It explores Tolkien's Legendarium. It's a thing that you are super passionate about. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first moment that you realized that that was something that you wanted to dig deeper into? Ooh. Yeah. So I have always really loved Tolkien, but I have never been... I don't remember being super, super like bonkers about him. And then I really sort of accidentally stumbled across Mythgard. Mythgard is an online university where you can take genre and Tolkien studies classes founded by a guy who started podcasting himself under the name The Tolkien Professor. He set up this soon-to-be fully accredited university. They're in the last stage of accreditation right now. And you can study things like science fiction and Harry Potter, and but their main shtick is Tolkien studies. And I stumbled across them totally randomly, and they were teaching a class on Lewis and Tolkien, looking at the relationship between the two authors. And it was it was like 400 bucks, and I didn't have a kid at the time. So I was like, hey, I'm money everywhere. Let's do it. <laughs> so I took the class, and uh, it was online. It was, you know, a le- two lectures a week or something like that, plus discussion sections. And that class blew my damn mind. There was so much interesting stuff going on in that class. And I'd never, it didn't even occur to me that people were doing 
scholarly work about Tolkien and the depth that these people were going into in his stuff and just the the enormous amount of material that you could dig into that was available. I mean, I just went in off the deep end with it. <laughs> and that was that was it. I spent, I mean, like the next four or five years taking every class I could from them. And I spent a lot of money filling out my library, buying like all the the materi- research material that I wanted. And yeah, that, that was really like the most intense period of my study it was right there was what, where I was really sort of diving in deepest and you know i got married and had a kid and things have slowed down a little bit on the study front but don't have as much time yeah Yeah. but it was that was what really what did it for me was finding uh myth garden that's crazy to me you're just like oh i'll just take this class like that's yeah it was that's a weird thing to do buddy well i I can't really (laughs) can't really deny that but yeah, that was that was what I did it. Do you have like a favorite weird fact that you like to tell people at parties, aside from the fact that there's no word for pants? A favorite weird fact. A- I was waiting for your answer to be like, I don't go to parties. <laughs> well, yeah, that well, I mean, there's that. But man, favorite weird fact. I don't even know where to start with that one. There is no... There is no word for pants in Quenya, for the record. I know. Um, uh, well, I'm clarifying for your listeners. We have looked every which way. <laughs> yeah, we've. Had, I, I went on a, an extensive search for the word pants, and there's no word for trousers or any other form of lower half covering in any <laughs> elven language. So, thanks. I did check in the movie. They did appear to be wearing pants, so... Well... Yes, Jackson takes a number of liberties, though. So, <laughs> so pants might be one of them. It may very well be, yeah. All right, I'll keep that in mind. So we're going to talk about incorporating religion and spirituality in two characters. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite example of that from a game that you've played or from a particular setting? Let's see. So a character of mine that I played that I think that I really enjoyed playing that worked into this i had a character named folly in a fifth edition campaign i don't particularly love D &D. uh it's fine but i was playing a character whose concept started as i can't say that word on your podcast but aragorn except not a good dude let's put it like that like garbage there you go garbage aragorn uh basically the idea was he was a scion to a noble line who instead of nobly upholding his people's values and carrying on those traditions was just kind of like not a scumbag well so in the original conception he was like a scumbag but what he turned into was just a dude who was just way more interested in being an adventurer and like the fun part than he was the responsibilities so he kind of ditched his his homeland and was just off being cool and having fun and kind of avoiding all the responsibilities of being the last of his bloodline. Uh, But he was a dragonborn sorcerer and his whole religious, the religion of his homeland was that all focused around these dragons. And the way that that manifested for him was he was super into dragons. (laughs) No, no. Yeah. Super into dragons. And it came out in a lot of different ways. And, Throughout the course of the game, as his backstory became more revealed, you saw that there was his, it started as a bit, just like everybody he met, he wanted to talk about dragons. And anybody that had any connection to dragon, he wanted to talk about dragons. But as it as the character evolved, the campaign went on and more of his backstory was revealed. It became clear that he had a dedication to this line of dragons that he was descended from. And he had a devotion to this ideal and stuff like that that was more than just silly bits i mean there were silly bits like well right the fire and the dragon thing he was on point with the fire and the dragon thing but it, it was also more about his his line and his worship of these dragon ancestors so that's cool yeah. even if that is like the most garbage concept it was a real garbage concept but it was a fun character games like that usually turn out to be really fun though 
when you start with something that you're like, there's no way that anything good will ever come of this. It might have been one of my favorite characters of all time to play because he was just just pure like bits. My favorite characters to play are the ones where you don't have to dig too deep to find like what's your motivation. Like you can kind of boil down for me at least. Like I don't I don't want to have to focus on like oh what's my motive in any given scene. I want to know I want to have like a core concept that I can hang on to and then work yeah. with in any at any time and that guy had it. He was he knew who he was and who he was was a guy that didn't want to be the who he was didn't want to be who he was <laughs> didn't want to be the last scion of a noble line just wanted to drink sleep on the floor make fire and worship dragons he had a real simple life plan and he was sticking to it <laughs> he knew what he was about yeah so now that we know more about you we're going to start the actual important part of this so I always say our goal with these episodes is to help people become better players at the table and to help them incorporate new concepts into their play and to increase the depth of their characters. We are going to talk about incorporating religion and spirituality into your character's story, how that affects your decisions, and how to play out some of those concepts. So before we start with that, I think we should probably give our basic disclosure statements on our backgrounds on this topic. Mine would be, I have no particular background other than I was raised super Catholic. That's like the extent of my knowledge or information. Is that different from normal Catholic? Yes. Yeah, so there's like Christmas and Easter Catholics, and then there's people that are like super Catholic. We were like the super Catholic. Duly noted. So for me... I did not get any kind of particular religious upbringing. My mother was agnostic, I guess. When I was 16, she decided maybe I needed a little church and started dragging me to the local Presbyterian church, which was way too late, Mom. Way too late. 16 is not the <laughs> age you start taking a teenager to church. So that didn't stick. And then in college, I got a bachelor's in philosophy and religion. And that was pretty informative. And then while I was in college, I got into Buddhism. And so I spent about 10 years pretty, I wouldn't say full-time, but I would say more often than not uh, doing Zazen at, the, at a Zendo, which is a Buddhist, Zen Buddhist. I never know how to translate the terminology. It's not like a temple or a church. It's just, it's a place where you go and you sit and stare at a wall, basically. It was a very informal type place. It wasn't someplace where you sit and sat and got a lot of sermons or anything like that. You pretty much just practiced the zazen. That was all you really did there. But I studied a lot of Buddhism through my classes, and that was my main sort of spiritual alignment for a long time. And I've since kind of drifted away from that over the years, but I still would say that's my nominal religious organization affiliation. I mean, that's like more than I've got now, which is like, I used to do this thing. I don't really do that thing anymore. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the extent of mine was like four years, three, hmm, four, five, three years of Catholic school, two years of being homeschooled by very Catholic parents because Catholic school wasn't Catholic enough. Dang. That's, yeah. So that's what we're working with over here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the best place to start for people is to talk about the alignment system that we're all pretty familiar with from D&D &D and games like it. How does something like that play into your character's behavior, potentially? I think the D&D &D alignment chart is really useful for funny memes on the internet. <laughs> but that's about it. I mean, strong, ag strong agree. I think if you are coming up with a cosmology for your home setting and you've come up with a reason why you really need nine gods along a really specific moral axis and you've got a just like an airtight reason why metaphysically that's the way you want it to be, 
you know, rock on with your bad self. That's cool. But I don't love the idea of locking everything into a specific two adjective moral coding because I feel like that really restricts a character's actions and options. And it is what leads to things like the lawful stupid paladin. You get characters who just, the the classic, well, that's what my character would do kind of syndrome. And especially when you're trying to portray a religious character, it becomes a crutch. It becomes a hindrance when you're trying to portray a character's faith and you you end up with this alignment that says, well, I have to do this because this is the good thing. And people are more complicated than that. And religion is more complicated than that. So I'm not a big fan. I think my frustration with it has always been partly in the fact that I don't think it allows for any real change or growth either. I mean, and I know that there's the argument that like, you don't have to stay that way. You just pick it at the beginning. But it's not, I don't know, it just feels like people are more nuanced than that and that's a really good point like what is lawful and what is not and what is like good and what is not are not clear always and i I just think that it like i don't know it oversimplifies things and it doesn't allow you to make those adjustments as you have experiences too yeah which i find incredibly frustrating same So, alignment system. It's garbage. Fight me. (laughs) (laughs) Please send your tweets, too. So, if you're playing a game where you aren't playing as a monk or a paladin, why is this a thing that matters? Like, what is the purpose of trying to incorporate this into your story? I mean, look at the Crusades is a good place to start. You had the political and sometimes literal geography of Europe transfigured by religion. You can name a, a probably a high double-digit percentage of the conflicts across the last couple of hundred years and say the same thing. Religion motivates large-scale conflicts and it motivates small-scale conflicts. It Just because you're not a professional religious warrior or anything doesn't mean that it doesn't powerfully affect people's characters or motivations. And it adds, oh, even if you don't want to get into heavy nonsense like that, it can add nuance to a character. Even if all you do with it is add small rituals or superstitions to your character, it adds a a flavor or a, a layer of depth. If, for example, you play a character that's from a culture that's not the same as the rest of your party, and you have slightly different superstitions that adds a perception of depth to your character you don't have to ever have to explain them you don't have to make a bit out of them but to the other people at your table that makes you seem just a little more foreign that feeling to the other people that there's something different about you just off the edge of your your character sheet that they can't see that feels really adds a nice meatiness to your character's personality I feel like there are lots of different parts of it that you can focus on, too, because I think it strongly affects... You just think, like, in real life, like, so much of the decisions you make and the way that you live your life is changed by what your religious upbringing is or isn't, you know? Like, I just think that my upbringing was so insanely different from yours, and the majority of that is because I was raised super Catholic, We went to church every Sunday and sometimes also on Thursdays and adoration on Friday afternoons. And when an ambulance drove by, you had to say Hail Mary just in case. And like all of those things are things that were affected by my religion. And like I do oncology research, like it has nothing to do with what I do as a job. Yeah. Religion is culture. And if you give your character... If you want to give your, your character culture and f- color, religion is a great way to do that. One issue that I think probably a lot of people come up against, and I feel like I have in other games too, is that settings don't necessarily give you a ton of information about what religion is like in that setting. You know, it's like sometimes you'll get like a small little section that is like, here's a list of gods and their domains or like. Here are some local religious practices, but it's not 
always, there's not always a lot to work off of. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some ways that we can sort of fill in those blanks for ourselves? I think there's a lot of ways to kind of think about that. I think there's a couple of different kinds of religion to kind of think about here. A lot of, especially game settings, look at religion pretty classically in terms of like organized religion or they, because religion's really literal, you have this God is a thing that absolutely exists. So it kind of all falls into that one category of organized church religions, the church of Vecna or the church of Torag or whatever. But religion and faith and spirituality aren't that clean. They're not that tidy. There's folk religions is one category that doesn't fall into that group. You have all sorts of cultural religious practices. That's stuff like superstitions and stigmas and things like that, where there's all manner of local practices that are restricted to a region or a particular culture that may not be associated with a particular, even a particular religion that may be associated with a culture, uh, but may be religious or spiritual in practice. Then there's obviously, there's the big church religions, Catholicism being the the kind of classic example with all the, the high ritual and the formalized ritual and things like that. And then you have the more, I'm going to use the more official usage of the term like mystical religions. And that's things like really kind of anything where you have an adherent working independently, trying to communicate with a higher power. So that's a lot of the monks and ecstatic religions, the Greek. A lot of the Greek cults and the Roman cults were mystic in nature things like that, all those hermits up in the mountains trying to see the face of God, that kind of stuff. And then just your run-of-the-mill spirituality, Uh, people who have their particular beliefs, they've formed their own sets of rituals and personal beliefs, all that stuff. I mean, there's so many different ways to slice the pie. These are all different ways that you can find a place where your character fits and these none of these games really give you a good place to not a lot of games i'm sure some games do but not a lot of games look at religion in that way so i think you can kind of just think about where your character is from and what kind of relationship your character has with their religion certain kinds of characters obviously and certain kinds of faiths are more obvious but I don't think it's necessary. I think it's interesting to think about it, to think about religion and be a little open to doing it differently, to think about looking at your traditional paladins don't always have to be a thinly veiled Catholic Templar. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's, there's opportunities there to do things that are more interesting and play things a little bit different. If there's not a ton to work with on. Sorry, I got way off into the weeds there a little bit. No, you're fine. I'm, no, it was... You didn't. If the setting itself or the book or whatever doesn't give you a whole lot of information on like what those practices look like, what do you do then at that point? Do you just like make stuff up? Do you... Like, what do you do? I mean, role-playing games are just like making stuff up mostly, but... For me personally, I spent a lot of time studying this stuff. So I've I've read a lot of books on this stuff and I've I'm familiar with a lot of different kinds of practices, so I I can kind of make stuff up. But sometimes I'll just hit up the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Stanford has a really good online encyclopedia slash dictionary type thing of philosophy and religious practices that is really interesting. I really like going there because they have the articles that they put up there are dense, but not unreadable to a layman like they're not like so you don't have a phd ha 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 get out it's not like that at all it's it's actually really readable and i found that's really useful because wikipedia can be a weird combination of like this is super like simplified but also super like 
dense and here's 84 sublinks you have to read down to understand anything you're reading. And I don't need like an entire history of everything yeah. that ever happened related to it. Yeah. But that also gets you into some other problems because then you get into like, well, is this is it entirely appropriate for me to be cribbing all of my, you know this character's religious practices from X culture, which is a separate question maybe. But that's generally my practice. My method is I'll go look at, I'll get an idea in my head of what I want this character's religion to look like. Uh, if he's going to be monotheist, if he worships a, a single god or a pantheon, or if he's kind of a out from the woods and he's just kind of a folk thing, I'll start thinking about what that looks like and then start Googling around for other similar religions or bounce around various terminology and just kind of start gathering ideas and writing it down. And then I start writing down things like small, not rituals, but small sort of small things to express that small ways in which that religious behavior can be shown. Cause I really like the idea, for example, with folly, one of the ways I wanted, I wanted to show that off was he had the, the tattoos, the dragon tattoos that were all over him were all religious, of religious significance, but they were hidden and he, he hid them underneath various other tattoos. And his name, for example, was a, well, it was Quenya because I'm that guy for- It checks out. For fire or for dragon. Folly is the, uh, one of the Quenya words for dragon. F-O-L-E is one of the Quenya words for dragon, mispronounced, and everybody thought it meant like mistake, folly, because he was kind of a screw up. Of course it was a pun too. Yeah. God, you're the worst. He he was putting the things that mattered to him into his life in subtle ways. And that's kind of that's a good summary of what I'm trying to get at here, because I I'm I'm not being as concise as I as I should be, but a lot of religious practice is about living the things you believe every day and finding ways to do that with your character that's not obnoxious and that doesn't irritate your other players and doesn't turn your religion into a bit is what you kind of want to aim for, for me at least. Certain settings and certain games have some ways of doing these things and, and some don't. I think... A lot of us think of like, this is a downtime activity. This is a thing that like you do while you're taking your long rest, you go to whatever shrine or temple or whatever it is and do your thing. And then like that is the only view that you get of this person having any kind of attachment to religion. Yeah. I mean, there's like sometimes symbolism associated with things, but really like it, it's not a thing that gets explored a lot i feel like at least not in games that i've played maybe i've just not played with the right people but what else can you do aside from just like having those moments while you're taking your long rest or whatever to tie that in to like make it feel more ingrained because religion is a daily part of your life if you are practicing it mm -hmm. i think the way to do that is to find I think it comes back to the idea of not making it a bit. Finding the things about your character's belief system that you want to put forward and then working them into their daily habits. So, I mean, it also really depends on what kind of faith. Something, if you're doing something with some more high ritual, like the Catholic stuff, like you were talking about, there's a lot of small rituals you can do. You don't have to make a big deal out of it every time you eat, you pray, or these are the obvious ones. But there can also be small superstitions. I had a friend of mine play the character one time that always entered water with their right foot first. Didn't make a big deal out of it. Just And when someone asked, they said, it's lucky. And their whole character was had these, because they were kind of like from a, a small uh, village, they had developed all these water-based superstitions they had a whole set of these small superstitions and rituals, and they didn't make a big deal out of it, but they built this picture of someone who lived in a world where things were meaningful, where it meant something. Water had an, an opinion of how you entered it. And yeah. 
So like narrating those small practices becomes really important in those cases. Yeah. And it didn't, like I said, didn't make a bit out of it and didn't draw attention away from, didn't drag the narrative into those moments all the time. Just Mm -hmm. so-and-so, you know, I'm a step in the river. And I think the first time that they did it, they called it out. But then after that, they just made a mention of it. And those are the kinds of things that were, I, th- I think are really cool because it it builds a picture of a character that has a personality and that has a, a more motive behind get from point A to point B. And I think, I mean, I really like that character. I thought it was a lot of fun. And it, uh, you really felt like, you, you really felt like there was a reason why they were doing things. Well, and it just adds like a whole different degree of background without having to write like 20 pages of backstory. Yeah. Like now you have all of these facts about this person and how they grew up and all that kind of stuff just based on yeah. this like small bit of information that you have. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of stuff like that that you can do. The return on investment on, on those kinds of things is really high. Uh, you can find small ways to show that your character is engaging in religious behavior without making without drawing a whole lot of time away to do it maybe every t- maybe every time you finish a mission you go and get a new tattoo you get what i'm saying you yeah i just think of like things that i still do like there are so many culturally catholic things that i still like have ingrained in me like if i lose something i will still like have this moment of like saint anthony where is it <laughs> because i'm so used to <laughs> being raised that way and so even though i i don't practice that like that is still a part of like my daily because i lose things a lot but just like those sort of small exclamations too are still things that are ingrained in how i do things yeah that's one of the classic ones that you see a lot in uh, fantasy books is the the fake the fake god nomenclature and i think that can work i feel like that one's a little risky i feel like if you've read a lot of fan anybody who's read a lot of fantasy books has heard the like by balthar sword kind of thing and yes. you're just like oh geez it's they're not the best they they, they yeah. kind of come off a little stale so if you want an, an example of one where, that works i'm gonna blow your mind here a little bit because this is i I've, I've talked about this before with other people and i get a lot of i get a lot of flack for this one but you want to know one that really works the Tim Allen movie, Galaxy Quest. Oh, God. By Grapthar's Hammer, I Will Avenge You. That line. <sighs> it wor- So they, when he first starts saying it, it's hacky. And it's like, it's the exact kind of thing I'm, I'm talking about here where you're just like, they lampshade it. Because it's like, it's this terrible line that's just bad. But by the end of the movie, when Alan Rickman, bless him, finally says it at the end, and it means something, you're like, yeah, man, buy Grapthar's freaking hammer. Go get some. <laughs> and it, they sell it. I, I bring it up because it's very hard to make that kind of a thing work. And you really have to like, you have to really get the audience invested in or get the the reader or whoever invested in whatever it is you're swearing to, because those sorts of exclamations only work when people know or understand or care about what it is you're referring to. And mm-hmm. you, you know, calling on St. Anthony to, to find your keys, like... It, it does not work. It doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry, mom. But it, <laughs> it doesn't work. It, 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 it's meaningful because you know who St. Anthony is and anyone else who's Catholic gets that. And... Even someone who isn't, who, you know, has been around enough Catholics or has seen enough uh, references to it gets that reference. But if you're playing a character and you're just like, damn you, back in the act, like it falls hollow. You, I'm wary of recommending people just like throw in random call outs to God. But I think there's value to that kind of, I get what you're saying, those, those sorts of uh, daily call out the things that are like so ingrained that you just like don't even think about why you're doing it almost like you know like i said like that's not a thing it, it does not work saint anthony does not tell me where my keys are 
and it's not a thing that I practice anymore, but it's still like so ingrained in how I do things that it is still my first instinct. Yeah, the the habitually ingrained behaviors. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things that make a character feel lived in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like they didn't just like spawn fully formed at age, what, 21, 18 to 21. Yeah. Whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. I think the other big thing that comes into play is how you make decisions. And this is always like kind of a tough thing because you run that risk of lawful stupid. But in real life, like so many of your daily decisions are affected by your belief system. Mm -hmm. So taking a minute to think about that feels correct and like a thing that you should do. So I will say this. I think it depends on what game you're playing. How so? If you're playing a game that is about drama and character motivation and a role-playing game, then yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree with you. If you're playing a murder hobo treasure gather simulator, or if your four friends are, and you're trying to work out your character's complex motivations for whether or not you should show mercy to this orc that's been chained to the wall and is groveling, you're maybe should just let it ride. And like, there's times you got to find the right game, uh, I think is what I'm getting to, because that's, I think, where a lot of conflict yeah. with this concept comes into play is one person's trying to exercise a, a, or some part of the group is trying to play one kind of game that has a lot of moral qualming or doesn't, and another person isn't. And I think that's where you get into trouble with like the lawful stupid paladin. One person really wants to have this really strict interpretation of their character's moral codes and the other people just want to get to the next treasure chest. If everybody's on board with that kind of like really aggressive moralizing, then I mean, I think the, I think the lawful stupid paladin is always a bad idea, but I think there's a place for people who want to do really strict or not strict, but really deep kind of interesting moral argument with their characters as long as everybody's on board with it but you, you got to have like the whole table buying into that kind of a game because that's not a that's not a solo play kind of situation right right and i think like for me those are the kinds of games that i like to play where you have those really tough moral gray areas that like right and wrong are not clearly defined not everybody likes to play those games i won't say those people are wrong but they're not playing the same game. So, yeah, I think if you have one person who's, like, trying to work out all of these, like, strong feelings and everybody else is like, we're just trying to get to the next town over. Like, we don't need to stop and process all of your emotions right now. You're, you're not going to enjoy that experience. I do think that as a person having an understanding of, like, what you want out of things, like, what your goals are should inform a lot of your decision making though. yeah and i think with religion you get us that becomes even more complicated because it because it, it can be a little more sensitive depending on how people how seriously people take things religion you have to be careful because religion can often be used as an excuse to be inflexible yeah and i think you want to be a don't be that guy but b you have to be careful when you're playing with these kinds of concepts that you don't that everybody's on board to to tell those kinds of stories. And even if you're working with made up religions, you know, you run the risk of getting into too familiar territory with people. And I think it's a situation where you need to have sensitivity. And that's advice that we give over and over again, I feel like, which is you need to know the group that you're playing with. You need to be aware of what those boundaries are and what people at your table find to be acceptable not everybody is religion is a very personal topic for a lot of people and because it's something that has a lot of real world analogs it's you run the risk of being offensive if you are not careful like yeah. and essentially making fun of something that is very important to somebody and that is definitely not 
an area that you want to get into, especially when you're playing with your friends. Like, don't be that guy. Yeah. Don't do that. Treat it carefully. But it's still worth trying out as long as you are willing to, like, put in that work and be reasonable. Yeah, I agree. Because this is a topic that's super important to some people and because it can involve real world things what do you feel like are the best ways to kind of be careful about that aside from just talking to your group about it i think it depends on whether you're talking about like D D religion or like real world religion i think a lot of games so like we played spire the other night mm -hmm. and spire has some dark dark stuff going on in it and it can get pretty grim but it's also very it has a very unique flavor and i wouldn't worry too much about the religion in spire feeling like it's going to be too personal or it's going to be too close to home for any of my friends i wouldn't yeah. obviously speak to anyone i didn't know but that's a game I suspect is not a game that, where you would have somebody feeling like, ooh, this is a little too much for me. This is a little too like close to my culture or something like that. I think that's... Amelia's aside, I would be worried. <laughs> yeah, that might be... Like maybe don't be friends with that person because they're creepy. Yeah, if, if, you, if you have a friend who worships a hyena, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's a really cool friend, or maybe that's a friend that you should worry you about. You should worry about. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, there's games that do play mo much more directly with real world religion that have thinly veiled analogs, or that play with the way re real world religion works and just slap a new name on it. Or there's games that are set in our world and you end up. I'm going to play uh, this person, this religion or this culture and this religion, like all the white wolf games or things like that. And that's really where I think you get into the danger zone. And I don't know, that's a subject that I... There's no real good answer for it. No, there's not. And I study this stuff. So obviously I'm interested in it. It's one where I, I love all this stuff. I think it's really interesting and I would love to play people from different religions and when i sit down to create characters of new religions i'm always interested to dig into other religions and pull the pieces i like but there's always that question of how appropriate is it for me the very very much straight middle class white dude to be like picking bits and pieces from world religions for his home homebrew rpg campaign like that doesn't always feel like it's appropriate all the time. And how appropriate is it for me to be playing a person of this particular culture and religion? That's always a concern that you're going to, how do you do that right? And how do you portray that and do that with respect? That's always something you have to worry about. I don't know. I don't have a good answer there. I mean, I, I think, I think that there are basic things that you can do. I think that it's it's really tough to get all the way right. I think really, I keep going back to what James said when we talked about character voices, which was basically just saying, having good intentions will not protect you and it is not a good enough excuse when you get things wrong. But making sure your intentions are good most of the time will steer you away from doing the wrong thing to begin with. So I think understanding what your intentions are, what your goal is, and being careful that those are reasonable and correct can go a long way. Yeah. There's still the potential to make mistakes and do things wrong and upset someone. And then I think in those cases, the best thing that you can do is apologize and own up to your mistakes. But I think starting with good intentions and starting with a solid base of knowledge is probably the best way to go. Be careful that what you are doing is not willy-nilly. <laughs> that it's like you are doing it for the right reasons and you are you are working with factual information. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I think when it comes to religion, it's it's both more and less complicated because you do have people from in a lot of cases 
you have people from all all kinds of different cultures participating in all kinds of different religions, you do have a lot more exposure and a lot more information about religions out there. It feels like there's a lot more information about a lot of religions out there, and it's easier to do a lot of religious stuff right than it is to get a lot of the cultural stuff right. Mm -hmm. There's obviously some big exceptions to that, but I don't feel like I'd have a whole lot of problem portraying at least a lay Catholic. Like I'd be pretty comfortable with that. And I'd probably, if you give me enough time to research it, I probably could pull off a reasonably serious Catholic, maybe not a Amelia intense, <laughs> teenage Amelia intense Catholic. Yeah, but, hey, that took a lot of work. But then there's other other religions that are a lot more bound up with culture that are a lot harder to approach. And that gets more complicated. Well, and also just, you know, not as close to your own life too, because I can guarantee that you personally know lots of Catholics. I don't actually. Oh my God, really? No, I well, don't. That's, you are not from the Midwest though, I guess. No, I, I grew up a lot in of California. Us here. Yeah. There's a lot of us. Wisconsin is like primarily Catholic and Lutheran. Okay, so for a lot of people, it, it is not hard to find a Catholic person in your life. You could find one. It's not always that easy. And so I think in those cases, it gets a little bit tougher too. Yeah. Like it's not something that you are exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. How do you balance having those religious aspects in your character with having a playable game? With those things being important, but not getting in the way of the story. So for me, unless unless the, the story is about religion, unless the story is fundamentally constructed around whatever the religion our characters religions are and that's what it's all go that's the story we're telling those religious details are there to add depth to the character they're there to give them more flavor so i don't want them to be i don't want to spend time on them when i could be interacting with other characters or building relationships or doing meaningful character work with other people i want them what I want to use them for is to take a moment where I'm doing a normal thing and make it more interesting when I'm doing it. So for example, the, the aforementioned crossing a river thing is a, an example I really like to give because it takes a, a moment where a character is doing something they have to do. So the GM says, you got to cross this river. And the, the player made it interesting in a way that it made that character more interesting, but it didn't take any extra time. And it didn't derail the campaign any or derail the session any. It just made, it added some depth to the character while he was doing it. And that's what I think, one of the things that I think adding religion to a character can do. It, it can add that extra layer of depth. A lot of different things. Religion, it's not the only thing that religion is useful for, obviously. Right. And it's not the only thing that can do that. But any anything that is a habit that underlies your character can do that but i think religion really it's culture is what we're talking about doing that and religion is a, a really good way to add culture to a character and is a fundamental part of a lot of cultures too yeah and a lot of people a lot for a lot of characters maybe all your characters come from the same culture or religion is an, is in many cases an easier way to add culture to a character than than some of the other ways that we express culture uh, because when you're out adventuring you can't express the fact that your your character eats a certain kind of cuisine or a lot of the kinds of cultural details don't get preserved when you're taken out of your social context yeah like what holidays you're celebrating are not super important like while you're yeah, but religion is something that you carry with you. And I think that's one of the things that it can do really, really well. I think the concern always comes in when you have characters that sort of like, like that becomes the reasoning for everything and every practice is 
defined by those things that it starts to get, like, it gets in the way of what other people are doing. I just think about the fact that in daily life, that is also not how you practice religion. You are not, you are not perfect in doing those things all day, every day, all the time, every single decision that you make. Like, that's just not, you can try, like, you can try to live your life that way. And there are certainly plenty of people that do, but like, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Like, you still go to work and like, do your regular job and have conversations with people and are still like, most of the time an interesting person. And not every conversation you have is about that. Yeah. I think that unless you wanted to do a villain or some (laughs) sort of irritating NPC, that's a character choice that I would, I personally would not make because I feel like it would be more, I don't know. Annoying. Hostile (laughs) to the other characters. I'm of the opinion that you, there's very few campaigns where a character choice that is detrimental to other people's play experience is a good one. And designing a character who is going to be with a play style that makes it hard for other people to enjoy your character, like when your character is there, or you are by your nature going to be aggressive and a pain to other characters. I mean, I don't know. If that's how you fly... Maybe don't. Godspeed to your friends, but... Like, again, I don't want to tell anybody how to play, but, like, don't ruin the play experience for other people. That is definitely, like, a way to not play. Yeah. If your friends, if your game table enjoys that about you and you're the the lovable pain in their butt, then... Congrats on finding people to put up with you. Yeah. (laughs) God bless them. From my experience, I found that that doesn't happen much so i'd rather build a character that can do those things and maybe just not do them while also being aggressive and obnoxious about them there's ways you can be you can express your character that your character is pushy and if what you're trying to do with a character like that is show that you're pushy or zealous or very like devoted or aggressive with your belief there's ways to do that without also being obnoxious and all those negative terms as a player the right. character should be the jerk not not the player right which i think is is what i'm trying to get at is that like you can have somebody who is incredibly zealous about their religion but don't derail what everybody else is doing with that you know like trying to incorporate that in what is already happening rather than stopping what is happening to do that yeah agreed Anything else that you think that we did not cover? Any last words of advice? Always do blood magic whenever you can. Yeah. Oh, man. We didn't even. I know. Do you want to talk about it? Let's talk about it. I know I was waiting for it to come up. Let's talk about it. We have time. Let's talk about being evil. Yeah. And evil religions. Question mark. Are they really evil? No, not really. I don't think they're, well, it's not that they're not evil. It's that it doesn't matter. Oh, hot take. Okay, I'm listening. Where Are we going straight to L5R or are we going to go, are we speaking more broadly? Are we pretending that we're not talking about that go to? Ryan's not here. He can't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> I should, up at the top when I talk about myself, I really should have put like, I go to panegyrist right there at the top because that's kind of my trash. Wherever I go, I pick up that reputation. I mean, I feel like I should say that that's how this episode came about was a discussion of my feelings about, in particular, I think at that point I was talking about the Sith code, but like how that has informed decisions in actual real life, but like how it can inform decisions in a game too. So... I feel like this perfectly has room in this episode. Yeah. Well, so like, I am notorious garbage for the Lost and the Shadowlands in L5R. And that's because Daigotsu is great. And I think he's an interesting character. And one of the things that I think is most interesting about him is his faith. And it's, as a consequence, all my L5R characters are priests. 
all of them. I've never played a character in L5R that is not a, at least to some degree, a worshiper of Daigotsu or Fulang. I've played one samurai and the rest have all been Shugenja or priests. And that's because one of the things I find most interesting about him as a character is the way he's had to balance his faith against his loyalty to his family. And is a great character study about how to use religion to inform and deepen a character, even though his faith is undeniably evil. He worships a god that is soups evil. and For sure. He's like a- tried to destroy the world several times over. Yeah. Fu Lang is the champion of the realm of, of evil. And Daigotu is bound to the to a demon like there's no part of him that's not evil but he still does honorable follows a an honorable code and balances his worship of an evil god against his love of his family and i just think that's a really just a really terrific way to show religion and how evil religion can be portrayed in an interesting way i've always liked that character and that that use of the character. He gets a lot of trash thrown at him for being overused and so on and so forth. And most of that's fair. But I think people overlook the interesting character work that was done with him, particularly with regards to his faith and family. I think that there's this immediate reaction of like, oh, that's a bad guy. I don't want to have anything to do with that. I'm the protagonist. And that's... Like, we're, we're not all Gryffindors. Everyone needs to settle down. Yeah. I like to play those kinds of, like, complicated and nuanced characters that are like, maybe this is a bad thing, but it's still important to me. And now I have to figure out what to do with it. And I don't know. There's just, like, so much there that's incredibly interesting to me that I don't feel like we do enough with, personally. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I I very rarely play the protagonist character. And I think that's one of the things that's the most interesting about The Lost to me in L5R is these are people who are corrupted, but are still trying to hang on to an, a vision of the world that they left behind. And that's what Daigotsu offers them. He offers them a, a dark mirror of Rokugan, a way to still be who they were and have the life they had, but not. And he manages to not only be a paragon of his own dark moral code, but in many ways, he's a paragon of the moral code of his enemies. I think that's really interesting. He's as dedicated to Bushido and his god according to the rules of his enemy, uh, of Rokugan as he is to his own people. That's because Rokugan's rules are terrible. Well, yeah, they're objectively awful. Yeah. But I also feel like that's an... In- I mean, I could talk about L5R forever and do often. But, I mean, I always feel like that's an interesting part of that setting, too, is that, like, this moral code that everybody follows and is so insistent on is, like, not good, it does not make for good decision making or what we would consider at least now to be like remotely morally responsible. Well, it's a Bronze Age moral code. That's why. Oh, for sure. It's just I, I think that that's part of what I find interesting about that dichotomy is that this person that's super evil is like the one that's like not being garbage, but also garbage. Well, that's the thing. He's Daigotsu is honest about I mean, for a guy yes. who is like leader of the shady folk he's very very honest about who and what he is never takes off a mat the mask but still manages to be the most straightforward in a lot of ways he states up front i'm gonna put my bloodline on the throne and is pretty clear about his intentions all the way through there's something to be said for knowing what you're getting yeah yeah, he's a good character. I, I, I'll i I'll fight anybody on that one. Please, again, write us yeah. about now. What, what is our list now um, about Daigotsu and our feelings on socialism? Yep. Yeah, no, and I just, I, ugh, I have so many feelings about it. 
balancing the idea of selfishness in a good way is, I don't know, we're going to have to do a whole, that's a whole other thing. We don't have time for that. I have, guys, I have a lot of feels. <laughs> and I would love to talk about all these things all the time forever. No, the idea of like, you can still be religious and not good. Yeah. I know, it's it's more complicated than that. What I like about Dags is he Dags is a is a character who shows if you look at it from the point of view of if you imagine him as a character that somebody's playing and you're looking for looking for how what can you learn from this character? This is someone who his faith informed literally every choice he made. His motive from his first appearance on the scene was motivated by advancing the goals of his God up until he, he got a family. And then all of a sudden he had two competing goals. He had my God who says this and my family, which I suddenly value. And that's a really interesting way to play a character is conflicting priorities. My faith says to do one thing and my I have another. That's like the classic L5R conundrum. That's why I love that game. Because I love those really uncomfortable moral quandaries of they're both correct, but I can't have them both. Yeah. And I love that Daigotsu nails it. Just crushes that problem completely. Right out of the park. He navigates that problem so clean. And his God doubts him, and he proves himself worthy of his God's confidence. That's awesome. And ends up, I mean, it, well, then things get complicated after that. But Well, it's L5R, and that, yeah. yeah, it goes off the rails a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, but I like those really, I, I mean, and that's a thing that I think that having religion be a fundamental part of your character can add is that that really complicated motivation of deciding what is most important to you. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like there are very few other things that really do that in quite the same way. Yeah. We, we talked about this. I think I mentioned it earlier is that religion is a piece of culture you carry with you. And I think that's a really good way of thinking about it is this is some, a, powerful piece of motivation that can be bigger than your individual character that can act on you regardless of where you go. You may want one thing, but no matter where you go, you can have this enormous force of your going back 30 generations, your family has striven to achieve X or your whole society believes Y or you saw the face of God in meditation and it told you Z, whatever it is that you construct, you can have this much more significant piece of culture connected to you via religion than you normally would be able to have through a normal character backstory. And those things are still present no matter what you are doing yeah. in the story, which I feel like is fundamentally important. Yeah. No matter where you go with that character, you can take him out of out of his country, you can take him anywhere, and that religion goes with you. If it's a similar backstory, oh, your your family says you need to marry and carry on this tradition. Well, you take him away from his family, that, that tradition goes away. I, I think it's, I'm not saying that religion does totally unique things, but I think it does interesting things, many of which, and it does them really efficiently in a lot of ways. I would strongly agree. And I think that, yeah, it's it's a thing that's very easy to show that doesn't, it doesn't require completely changing the way the game is played. Yeah. Okay. So aside from that whole aside, <laughs> anything else that we need to talk about? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. Well, thank you for sitting down with me also on very short notice mm, and no for talking about trash with me and also not trash, but a little bit of trash. A little bit of trash. Do you want to remind everybody who you are and where they can find you? Sure. I'm Jude 
I am the co-host with my friend Steph of the Atherbeth podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Atherbeth underscore cast. I'm on Twitter at Aramitic Jude. And you can also find us on the web if you're one of those old people that still use websites at podcast.atherbeth.com. I'm super excited for this to come out. I, I, like, I'm so excited about this project. Like, you know all sorts of things, and Steph is hilarious and also knows things, and I, it's going to be good. It's gonna yeah, be good. I'm really excited about it. All kinds of elf garbage to yes. talk about. Yes, it's going to be good. Well, thank you for sitting down with me. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you for inviting me. Yes, anytime. And we will be back next week. Character Evolution Cast, like Character Creation Cast, is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for today's guest can also be found in the show notes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, do not visit oneshotpodcast.com to find other great shows like System Mastery, because they're not on the website. System Mastery is a delightful stroll through the history of role-playing games, except the games are terrible and the hosts are real jerks about everything. Join hosts Jeff and John as they explore the weirdest games ever made to talk about what worked, what went wrong, and which Silverhawk was the best. It was Hot Wing, don't even add us. Find their shows at systemmasterypodcast.com.